morning, everyone, and welcome to the Promise Church. My name is Justin, and this is my brother Christian. Promise Church is passionate about helping people follow Jesus, learn the Bible, and build a family. We would like to take a few minutes to announce some very exciting things happening at Promise Church, including some very important news. If you are here for the first time, we would love to answer any questions you may have. We would also love to keep you up to date on all things going on around here all week long. Please stop by our guest connection table after the service for a free gift that includes chocolate and fill out a connect card. That would mean the world to us. We are so happy to announce that the Women's Bible Study will be back in action beginning February 5th at 7 p.m. They will be meeting in the lower level of the Baker Community Center and going through a wonderful book called In the Eye of the Storm. For more information, please go to hispromisechurch.org and click on Ministries to find Bible Life groups. Promise Church is offering its very first partnership course. This will take place Thursday nights beginning of February 15th through March 14th at the Baker Community Center. We are calling this course Old Hearted. If you, are, if you call Promise Church your home or if you would like to learn more about Promise Church, this is for you. Pastor Reno, Reno will be leading us in a five-week course that answers the following questions. What is church membership? Is partnership different? What does the Bible say about joining the, the local church? We will also learn what the Bible has to say about our God-given gifts and how we can use them to help people follow Jesus, learn the Bible, and build families. The last portion of the course, we will look at our core values, which we call the six. The word prayer, people connecting with people, telling others, serving, and multiplying. Sign-ups will take place for the next three weeks. Pastor Reno will be hanging out at the guest connection table to help you sign up. Are you married, remarried, or ready to be remarried? Join us for a weekend to remember the marriage retreat. This all happens Friday, March 22nd through Sunday, March 24th, 2024 at the Hilton Chicago Oak Brook Hills Resort. Weekend to Remember is a faith-based marriage conference and romantic retreat for everyday life. This will help people. This will help couples choose oneness. Whether you're looking for someone to help or already doing great in your relationship, Weekend to Remember it is your best next step toward being and staying one in Christ. Partial and full scholarships are available. Please see Pastor Reno. If you need more information, no couples get left behind. Please visit our website at hispromisechurch.org and click on the details and registration link. We consider giving an act of worship. If you would like to help with financial gift, you can drop your offerings in the wooden boxes in the back. <laughs> you can also get securely online by using the computers at the information center or at his promise church dial. Promise Church has been so blessed and we are so thankful for the continuing support of all that you make possible for your faithfulness and financial support. While we are waiting for our new location to come together, please note that we will temporarily meet at the Bartlett Nature Center, also known as Paid Park, for the month of February. This is the same place that we had our barbecue session, which was great for me, um, in the summer. It is located at 2054 Stearns Road. This is just east of Route 25, or three miles west of Route 59. Please take a postcard home and help us get the word out. See you all there next week. Thank you so much for listening, and we hope that you're blessed by the rest of the service. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Promise Church Unplugged. <laughs> Last Sunday here at Anne, it's great to hear you here with us today. My name is Justin Paul. I serve here with my family, as I mentioned before. Uh, well, I was recently reading a devotion from Jeremiah, which I shared in our last elders meeting. 
that I thought was particularly appropriate for us right now. Uh, many of us know the famous Jeremiah 29 11, but there's a lot of great stuff around that verse as well that I think can speak to us with what we're going through right now. It's the Israelites, of course, during their exile to Babylon, and some of the false prophets have been telling them, you know, two years and we'll be back in our homeland. And God said through the prophet Jeremiah, nope, sorry, it's going to be 70 years. Uh, so you're going to have to wait a little while. But that doesn't mean you can't be productive you know, in the waiting time. So I kind of feel like that's a little bit where we're at right now. Where, um, the Lord is guiding us you know, through this time. And uh, we're patient and we feel like he's bringing us right to the doorstep our new home, um, but we're not quite there yet. And so, um, but he says some interesting things during that waiting time. Jeremiah 29, 6, he says, Multiply, do not dwindle away. Work for the peace and the prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. And then further down in verse 10, he says, This is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon for 70 years, but then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised, and I will bring you home again. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. I will gather you out of the nations where I sent you bring you home again to your own land. Let's pray. Lord, like the Israelites, you have guided this little flock from one meeting place to another over the past three years, and we know that you will continue to guide us in the future. We thank you for the kind and accommodating spirit we've received from the owners at Illinois Avenue. You've opened doors, you've brought us to the doorstep of our new home, we believe. We ask that you help us walk through that door soon survey and special use permit in the city of St. Charles. We know the hearts and minds of the government leaders are in your hands and you can direct them, so we ask that you will. We ask that you bring the details together for our upcoming wholehearted partnership course. We pray there would be a time to grow the faith of those who attend and show us how we can serve you, Lord, in the Bronx Church. We pray for those whose families have recently lost loved ones and are grieving those losses. We lift up to you the Valente family, as well as our friend and recent speaker, Gordon Spar. Comfort them in their time of sadness. We pray for Tim Lorman's neighbor's mother, who recently took a serious fall and has been hospitalized. We pray for her daughter and son-in-law, who knows this is causing heavy stress for them. Is there another year? Lord, I ask you to comfort Kimberly Pelling and Ed and their boys. As you've heard recently, the tumor's grown, and they are searching for answers on what to do next. Please give them your peace, which is different from the world's peace. Help them to trust you, even when things are so scary, Lord. For others who are ill, Paolo, Hank, Doreen, Tim and Berlin, Anna Muley, Joe and Maria, and others who are suffering sickness. We also pray for those who may be suffering, suffering with physical, mental, relational, emotional struggles. We praise you, Lord, that you are in the details and you are behind the scenes, moving those scenes that you're behind. As our real estate agent recently said, it appears that you have brought us a very, very nice landlord at Illinois Avenue. We know that's not an accident. After the research on more than 40 properties, we feel like this is the one. We continue to hold that before you, Lord, with open hands and ask you to bring those final details to this is starting to look like our promised land, the promised church, but help us to trust you in this last step, even if it goes slower than we might prefer. Again, we ask that you work in the hearts of those government leaders in St. Charles as they renew our special use permit application. And protect this flock, Lord, as we move from place to place. As David said so beautifully last week, Lord, the church is not a building, we are your church. Help this body to stay energized desirous to meet together, no matter where you have us meet the time being. As our scripture said, help us to seek the welfare of the city where we meet, whether that be in Bartlett or St. Charles, perhaps in the New Nature Center, Lord, where we're going to be meeting, you have souls waiting in that building and we can be part of saving. 
Finally, Lord, we thank you for the way that you've provided for our financial needs every step of the way. We know that you will continue to do this for the people of this body going forward. Help us to remember, Lord, that everything we have belongs to you. Help us to give cheerfully as your word is Now I ask that you to strengthen Rena, Lord, to come and bring one more message here to Ains in the book of Matthew. We love you, Lord. Amen. Well, good morning again, everybody. How are we doing? I was told to talk loud, so don't think I'm yelling at you, okay? You're not in trouble. It's because we're unplugged here today, and the technology is not what it normally is. If you're here for the first time, or for that matter, if you have not been connected to Promise Church yet, I just want to personally invite you to just take a moment, please, and stop by that computer right there on that desk, press the connect button. I'll be hanging out there after this so I can help you do it. Promise Church is going to be moving. There's some uncertainty as to where and when we will be meeting. Therefore, I want to make sure you guys don't show up somewhere you're not supposed to show up and then get mad at us. <laughs> we, we try to keep it family here, and family tries to have each other's back. So if you can do that, I'd really appreciate it, okay? Next, if you're here for the first time, I personally want to welcome you. I thank you so much. I see a few new faces out there. I just thank you so much for kicking the tires on Promise Church. We are a plant, um, but we're starting to see the seeds break off the shell and the roots start taking deep root because of our God and his amazing hand and the way that he's moved things over the last few years here. Um, we're about 15 months old in this building, and as you heard, today will be our last day here. It's bittersweet. As we were preparing for this Sunday, we had our core team together in prayer, and we had our only God moments of Haynes, and I heard the most amazing things this morning, and we have our God to praise for that. So if you would join me for a moment, and just, for, just think about this. God lined up the stars for us to have the perfect place, the perfect people, both on the receiving end and the serving end, and we were able to see many souls saved in that gymnasium behind us as we had church. We were able to see people become family. We were able to see the most amazing things that are very biblical and that are a testament to what God has already put in place before it happened in the book of Acts. And even from Jesus' lips as he was getting his men ready to go out and multiply and flip the world upside down for Christ. So if you would just join me in giving honor to the Lord by applause, I'd really appreciate that. Again, if you're just joining us, we want to get you caught up. I want to make sure that you feel like family here. We don't want you to be left out. And right now we are in this wonderful study and our Sunday sermons called Jesus... Who is he? And we're navigating through the waters of the book of Matthew, also known as the Gospel of Matthew. And we are at the section in the, the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus is preaching this famous sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. And we said that Jesus' is teaching at this particular moment um, is carrying countercultural principles. We also even said that if there was a modern day title to this sermon that Jesus was preaching, he would call it countercultural. And Jesus is teaching us things that are bringing restoration back to the way that it was supposed to be. Back in the Garden of Eden, before all of sin and rebellion entered into the world and things changed. So Jesus is on the scene preaching the good news about the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of the world has been falling on its face. They've been worshiping idols. They've been chasing after all of the wrong things. So Jesus is trying to restore the godliness, the love, the joy, the peace, and the, and the way that God intended things to be. And he's taking back the ground that the prince of this world, Satan, is trying to take away from God. But God will not be mocked. Right? Right? And we know that God will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But before he built that church, he was getting people ready and teaching them what it meant to live in the here and now, 2,000 years ago, of what it looks like to embrace kingdom principles so that they can go out and share these things with not only Jerusalem, but the surrounding regions and then to all the world. So now Jesus is getting to the point in the sermon where he's warning people, look, I told you all these things, and it would be great if you can learn how to live this way. 
And Jesus knew the hearts and minds of people there listening to him. And he says, now that you know these things, it's not going to be a talent show. That's where we're going today. And he wants them to know that when you do these things, don't use them to look good in front of everybody else, but live these things for the audience of one. For the audience of one. I'm going to share a story with you guys before we get into our passage today. I'm pretty sure I heard this story from my grandfather who taught me everything I know about music besides my dad, because my dad taught me a lot too. And as you guys know, I've, I've been a musician since I was six years old, playing the piano and trying to sing sometimes. I, but I play better than I sing. In Italy, there was this grand concert that took place. It's in this region called San Remo. This is the capital city of music to the whole world. The most renowned musicians would come to this place and they would come in and enter into a concert to perform in the Colosseum. There was this young violinist that was working his way up and he was becoming very well known. And this kid was amazing. He was from Italy and this kid got so much attention, people could not wait to see him play. And his instructor was very well known because he trained some of the greatest violinists that have ever touched the violin. So the day came, and it was concert day. All the press is there. His instructors sitting in the audience. The Colosseum is filled with a pool of people. And the young man gets up, and he plays with the, the orchestra. The orchestra sits down, and the young man starts vigorously playing his, his uh, violin. And he's playing his solo, and he's playing with passion. And all of a sudden, the first string on his violin breaks. Now, you all know there's only four strings on a violin. He gets to the next part of his concerto solo, and he's playing it as if nothing ever happened on three of the strings of the violin. But guess what happens next? The next string breaks. He's down to two strings. But because this kid was so brilliant and he had the training and he had the source give him what he needed, he was able to continue to play the song. And as he was playing with that great passion, the third string broke and he's left with one string and on that final string he was able to play the song as if nobody ever noticed except where they saw the strings breaking when the young man was done the whole crowd burst up in unison applauding him with a standing ovation that lasted longer than any standing ovation in the history of those who performed at the Colosseum except for one person the ovation went on, that's how you say it, standing ovation went on for 15 to 17 minutes, records say. But there was one that was sitting down. And it was his instructor. And he knew it the whole time. The press came to him and said, young man, that was incredible. That was absolutely miraculous what you did. How do you play a violin like that? And break all the strings. And we know the song you played. You played it with passion and it was beautiful. And why do you look so down, by the way? And a man looked down and a reporter put his arm around him and said, in Italian, what's wrong? He said, you see, Mr. Reporter, I play for the audience of one. I play for my professor, my instructor. He's the source of who I am. And if I were to play for all these people, that's great. That's an aftermath. But I play for the audience of one. Now we are ready to get to the sermon for today. Please turn to your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 1 through 4. I would really appreciate it if you would hold the precious pages of the scripture in your hand. If you don't have a Bible, don't be shy. Raise your hand. We have some here on the aisles. Um, we got one over there. Yeah. There's another one there. I think we're set. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Jesus, taking it to the next section now. He just got done telling them what they need to do. And now there's a shift and a door is going to open in the middle of his sermon. So get ready for this. Verse 1. Watch out. 
Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do it as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they have received all the reward they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. Notice the very first two words there, and this leads me to my first point for the note takers. And I want to challenge you guys. Go to Walgreens, go to Walmart, wherever you're going to go, get a pen, get a fresh notebook, because for the, for the next few weeks here until we're home, we're not going to have screens. We're not going to have what you guys are used to. But why not take some notes in the middle of a sermon, write down the, the points and some of the cross references and stuff like that? Because you guys know that passion here of Promise Church is to help you learn the Bible, right? Yeah. So we can do that on Sundays too. So grab a notebook. If you don't have one today, don't feel guilty. It's okay. All right. Get one for next week and let's start doing this together. All right. First point, righteousness must be done right. Righteousness must be done right. Notice the first two words there. You see them? What are they? Watch out. There's a warning here. These two words are coming after Jesus has taught a very large portion in regards to the kingdom living and the countercultural life that Jesus wants us all to live in this toxic tension world that we all live in. This, world, this word here for good deeds also translates alms, A-L-M-S. I'm going to tell you what that means in a minute. So just hold your horses for a second there. Um, it could also mean righteousness. Now we saw this when he was challenging them to be salt and light to the whole world. Remember that? Okay. So Jesus says, watch out not to do these things publicly because if you do, you're going to forget that righteousness must be done right. So you got to have the right motive. Now, Jesus is about to shift, as I said, from the everyday social and civil living in light of the kingdom of God, and he's going to shift to the spiritual side. And he's about to teach about things that have to do with fasting and prayer and giving and serving and the way we are to pray specifically, as we're going to learn very soon. And this comes off of what he just taught us in Matthew 5, 21 through 48. Remember, anger. Lust, divorce, vows, revenge, and love. So now, if he's going to teach us the spiritual, and kingdom living is not a talent show, what do we learn from this in this first verse? What we learn here is this. Kingdom living is a result of one who has repented and understands that God has given this person a new heart a new thinking, a new behavior, new desires, new passions, because you've come to understand the eternal rescue that Jesus and what he did on the cross has saved you. And not only has he saved you, he's changing you from the inside out. That is the motive for kingdom living. This is why the nine word sermon from John the Baptist and Jesus says this, repent, he could have just said that. And everybody would say, all right, we know, we've been messing up. Got to change direction. We got to have a change of thinking. But he didn't leave it there. He said, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Or the kingdom of God. Same thing, it's God's kingdom. Okay? So Jesus is not saying to learn all these things so you can go and show off in front of everybody. Because if you do, you'll notice there in verse 1, you can never get the reward from people the way that God can reward you. Jesus says, if you're going to choose kingdom living so that you can look good in front of people, you're going to actually lose your reward. You see that in 1B? There in that first verse. This brings us to our second point of four today. Godly giving is for the audience of one. Godly giving is for the audience of one. Promise church. We got to be careful. We got to check our motives for why we do what we do. We do. I don't want to lose my rewards, and I'm sure you guys don't either. And just so you know, there's a lot of rewards. One day I'm going to have a sermon just on all the rewards of heaven so you guys can know what I'm talking about. But believe me, they're a lot different than what you think here on earth. 
There are things that are unfathomable, unthinkable, things that would blow your face off literally if you really knew about it. So listen, these commands that Christ has given, they are the means and methods to living in the kingdom of God, but they're not the means and methods to look good in front of other people. Now, God, because he'll never be mocked, I'll tell you this, even if we are serving to show off in front of other people, God will use it. He uses it. He uses it all. He works all things together for good. All things. So Jesus is saying, listen, instead, this is what you need to do. Live out your kingdom life for the audience of one, just like the violinist. Recognize the source. Remember the source. Remember what is giving you this ability to live out in the kingdom of God. Salvation in Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So he says, live out your life for the audience of one. Now take a look at verse two. He says, when you give to someone a need, don't do it like the hypocrites do. Blowing the trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they've received all the reward they'll ever get. So Jesus uses something that these people already know to magnify his principle. And what he's doing now is he's saying, look, if you're going to live out your kingdom life for the audience of one, you remember that God gets the glory and there's no need to go and blow trumpets to bring attention back to you or to what actually happened. It's a good thing what happened. People have given. And that's great because when we give, we make a sacrifice. But what he's saying here is there's specific people here. There's three identified people in verse 2. It's those who are someone in need. You see that there in verse 2 in your Bible? It's the hypocrites. And then it's the people in the synagogues and streets. So he makes the circle bigger and bigger. Who are those in need? These are people that we are to show mercy to. Practice compassion towards. This is the beauty of those who follow Jesus Christ. It's the DNA of the church. It's to help those who can't help themselves. Generosity and, and compassion are the watermark of a Christian because Jesus looked on to people with compassion and even said these words, I quote, I look upon these people with compassion because they are like sheep without a shepherd. So generosity and compassion are going towards those who are someone in need. And for those who are in need, Jesus is saying this happens through the synagogues and the temples. Because those who are leading in the synagogues and the temples were in charge of a certain budget and there was some reserve to take care of those who are in need, just like we do in a church today, right? But then it became the local church. And we see this throughout the New Testament, especially in the book of Acts. And we're even given some rules to follow so that we can take care of those who can't take care of themselves. Who else is someone in need? Someone in need is those who are leading and guiding a church. A local church is someone in need, believe it or not. Now, hold on a second. I want, I want to explain what I mean by that. See, at Promise Church, we realize that the leadership and the pastor and the elders are not the church. You are. And we realize that the church can only stand on a firm foundation is if we lead and guide and cast the vision as leaders and as elders and as pastors to show you guys what it means to be increasing in generosity. Increasing in generosity. You follow me? So someone in need can be the local church. We have a lot of needs. We got a lot of bills to pay. And we got a lot of people we want to take care of. Some of them can't take care of themselves. And because of that, this is who else Jesus is talking about here. Now, these people belong in the very seats of the church. There are people that are in need here. And like I said, the DNA of the church has always been to be compassionate. And this is how God set it all up from the beginning. From the very first worship service that was about to begin. God gave very special, special instructions and he included instruction to support the work of the tabernacle, which is a pop-up church plant that would set up and take down, set up and take down whenever God told them to. But he said, before we even plant this church or tabernacle, where my presence will be, we're going to have to support it. So I want to ask you guys, please, as I touch hearts, have faith, go out, ask 
because we're in need. Collect gold, silver, and bronze. Collect whatever you can to support the work of the ministry. And this support would have gone to people serving in the priesthood and to support all the items needed for ministry that God has selected this special tribe who are actually called the Levites. These people were so set apart that God even told them, look, you're not even going to get land. Okay, you're not. I'm going to give it to you. You guys are going to have to fight for it. I'm going to give it to you. And he did. He gave them a land where they can pasture sheep because they needed all the animals that they needed for sacrifice. And they didn't work in the marketplace. This was their full-time job. God even gave the Levites land and ordered people to give to them so they can be supported, so they can be wholeheartedly committed without any interruption or distraction to serve the Lord in their called ministry. I want to tell you, we count on the provision and the financial support of Promise Church. But God has been awesome. You guys are the most amazing people. I'm telling you that with my heart. I can't believe, some of you guys, I know your financial situation. And I don't know how much anyone gives. I don't want to know. I'm not even a signer on our account, just so you know. And I don't even have access to see who gives what. And I don't want to know. But once in a while, you guys slip and you say, you know, I, you know, I I gave this much. I'm like, I, I don't want to hear that. But you want me to know because you want, you want me to know because compassion is contagious. It is. Generosity is contagious. And it's a good thing. All right? So now this requires faith. What kind of faith? The high schoolers know this. They just learned this this last Wednesday. They talked about faith in works from the book of James. And we gave a definition to faith. We said faith is trust plus belief equals faith. Trust plus belief equals faith. But I told them that's not good enough, guys. A real faith, according to the New Testament, especially the book of James, is active faith. So we said trust plus belief plus actions equals active faith. Active faith is saving faith. Active faith is a faith that tells you that because the kingdom of God is at hand and you realize that you've been saved from your sins and rescued from hell and you're going to heaven where there'll be no more crying, no more, no more uh, sorrow, all right? No more death, okay? Um, your uncontrolled response is to have active faith. The last people here are the hypocrites. We got to mention them here. I'm sorry, the second people here mentioned are the hypocrites. The Greek translation here points to an actor. The word here supports someone who would show up with different masks and put them on at certain times during a theatrical um, production. And this is where we get the word two-faced. This is where we get it. And the hypocrites could also mean those religious leaders, especially the Pharisees, because these were people that would blow the trumpet, and let everybody know what they did, right? And these are people that sometimes would walk up to the temple and there was this huge trumpet-like vase, had this huge, like, just picture a tuba, right? A big, huge tuba. And people that wanted to let the people behind them or in front of them know how much they're given, Man, they, they like made a lot of noise when they put it in there. You know, instead of like just aiming for the little like hole where it, 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 it like collects, just like they put them on the edge, like clink, 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 you know. They wanted everyone to know that they're giving, right? Those are the hypocrites. That's what he's talking about here. And they're giving alms. Now, remember, I told you I'd come back to it. I didn't forget. What is an alm? The word alm means mercy filled giving. The word translates mercifulness giving, but mercy-filled giving, a compassion prompted financial gift. That's what Jesus is talking about here now, okay? So I want to make sure you understand. I know I touched some other ways of giving, but we're going to keep it in context, okay? So they were using these alms and putting them in this big, huge trumpet, making all kinds of noise so they can show off. The last people here are the people in the synagogue in the streets. And we can learn from this, Promise Church, if our motive is to get others to see how much we're giving so that we can get praise and recognition from them, this is wrong. It's wrong in God's eyes. You forget the source. You forget your Savior. You forget who's all-powerful. You forget the one who provides everything that you need. 
See, Jesus starts with our treasure, which is alms. And it really is easy to give and do acts of charity when you're noticed by everyone else. But he's going to shift, like I said, to the spiritual, which is prayer, fasting, and generosity. And these are all righteous things, but righteousness must be done right. Now, let's go to 2B in your Bible. Get your eyes down on the words that say, I tell you the truth. You see that there? I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth, they will receive all the reward they'll ever get. Now, this word for reward, it comes up three times in the passage, and I want to, you guys to notice that this word is a lot different than the translation in verse 4. You got to catch this, because Jesus is doing a play on words here. And what he's saying is, this reward is the type of reward that appropriately compensates somebody with a monetary gift that they, that they it's not a gift, I'm sorry, a monetary wage paid, right? It's not a gift. So you come and mow my lawn, you told me that you're going to charge me 30 bucks, I give you 30 bucks. This is the reward that he's talking about. The word reward translates wages here, okay? Now, you see how it says they received all the reward they'll ever get? So what's the reward that they'll ever get? Well, it's not the heavenly reward that he talks about in verse 4. See, this reward is recognition from people, not from God who owns it all. This reward is praise from people and not from God who is all powerful and offers more than any reward could ever. This reward for self-recognition, it will only give you a pride boost, but God opposes the proud and he gives grace to the humble. You might get more likes on social media when people see your generosity out in the public eye, but would you rather receive likes from a human or a blessing from God who can overwhelm you with grace. You might get more friends. Are these people really truly your friends? If they only like you because you're a giver, a big huge giver for attention, you might get more ego if you're giving. Remember the audience of one. The rewards that they get are temporal rewards, but God gives eternal rewards. He gives eternal rewards. And people can only give one reward that leads to eternal rewards, and that's the gospel. That's the good news that Jesus saves. That's the good news that he, God, gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will never die but live forever. And God is counting on us to use our mouth to tell others, to use his word and to sit and reason with people. And this is a reward that will never, ever perish. And it's the greatest reward that any of us could ever get. And I wonder if you receive that reward. I wonder if you're here today and you don't know that. I wonder if you don't know that God gave his son so you can live forever. And without you coming to faith and believing that, you will not live forever. And that's bad news. But you can't have the bad news without the good news. And I don't know all of you guys here. But I want to make sure we depopulate hell and make heaven crowded. Very crowded. So if you haven't made that act of faith, please do it today. Today is the day of salvation. Surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Tell him that you're sorry for your sins that separate you from God. Because God gave his only one son. That whoever believes in him will never perish and have eternal life. If that's you, come and see me right after this. I have a Bible for you. It's called the New Believer's Bible. And it'll help you get on a, a track of life that will change things that you never thought can be changed. And it'll give you peace and joy that never, you never thought you had. And you'll be embraced by a family that will love you like no other. Amen? Amen. All right, look at verse three. When you give to someone a need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. As I was studying this, I, I ran across something from Charles Haddon Spurgeon. I don't quote too many people, but since he's the prince of preachers, and I've come to realize that he truly is the prince of preachers, and not just because people say he is, God supernaturally gifted this guy. He says this, when you're giving, quote, keep the things so secret that even yourself are hardly aware that you are doing anything at all praiseworthy. Let God be present 
and you will have enough of an audience. Right? Let God be present, and you will have enough of an audience. In other words, do it in private. God will bring the people. Don't do it to bring the people. Leave that up to the Lord. Why? Why? Well, I got a question. Have you ever asked yourself why you give? Why do you give? Whatever it is. We've had a lot of things here at Promise Church. The Compassion Fund. Sunday mornings. Right? We ask for the offering on Sunday mornings. How about when there's been special needs? Right? Where we've come alongside and taken care of some people. How about CareNet? Remember CareNet? To save babies from abortion. Right? Why do we give? Think about that. I'll tell you. You want the godly response? Here's a biblical response why you should give. This is my third point. Godly giving equals godly rewards. But godly giving, not giving. There's a difference between godly giving and giving. When you're giving, is it godly giving? Or are you giving to be seen by everybody else? That's what Jesus is talking about here. Now he switched to another reward. Look at this in verse four, our last verse. Give, her, give your gifts in private and your father who sees everything will what? Will reward you. This is a different word for reward. It's not wages. This word, oh, it's a special word. I hugged this word this week, all right? This word says to give to return, especially as a payment in relation of those who are undeserving. This is when God does things to blow you away. This is when you can't explain why that check came in the mail. When you knew that you tried to give one week and you probably shouldn't have, but you realize that you should pay God first. So you do. These are amazing things. The other reward that God gives you is so amazing to think about because godly giving, not giving, Godly giving is a natural response to what God has done for you in Christ. I've said that about five times, but I want to make sure you can't miss that. That's why we give. We give because he gave it all. He gave his son. Would you give one of your sons or daughters? I got four daughters. When you get a little scratch on them, I'm running for a Band-Aid, let alone just giving my daughter to go be crucified, right? Come on, guys. We really need to wrap our arms around this truth. When we give in anticipation and joy, and when we give considering the act of worship, understanding this definition of godly giving, not giving, we're giving in a way that we say that we're giving a return as a payment in relation to the source of the one giving back. Understanding that I'm not expecting anything back from you, God, but I know that you're good and every good and perfect gift comes for you. So because godly giving equals godly rewards, I'm gonna give, and if you reward me, great. But if you don't, I'm fine. But I know you're gonna, because you're my dad. And that's what you do. I ask for the big wheel, you buy me an electric scooter. $300 more, right? I ask for the iPhone 6, you gave me the 10. You know, that's how God does it. But this requires faith. And you gotta understand the difference between godly giving and giving. And it's done for the audience of one. The more intimate, secret giving you do with God, the more you will fall in love with Jesus. And the more you'll have these secret, intimate things that only you and God know. Sometimes I give, my family doesn't even know. And I'll give you an example. One, okay? Because I want this to be contagious. Sometimes I'm at a restaurant. The bill's only 10, 12 bucks. I got a 20 on me, I'll tip him a 20. Should have only tipped him about two bucks, right? Because God has been so gracious to us. Those are the rewards he's talking about. Everyone gets rewarded. When godly giving takes place, everyone gets rewarded. The church gets rewarded. So we can pay our bills and we can preach the gospel, preach the word, help people, follow Jesus, learn the Bible, build family, take care of the lonely, take care of those who are depressed, take care of the widows that we have here. There's a day I remember it was the most intimate day of my life. Aside from my Christian walk. It was the day I got engaged. I remember knocking on my mother-in-law's door to be and asking my mother-in-law for her daughter's hand in marriage. She didn't know it. I knew it. I remember calling La Spiaggia downtown on Oak Street and Michigan Avenue, restaurant I'd never been to, knowing that I was probably gonna spend three, 400 in one day. But I worked up to it. 
I remember going and surprising my wife, thinking we're going to stay home and watch a movie, but I went to the store, and really nice store, and bought her all these things so she could have a full outfit so she wouldn't have to go home and change into something and not wonder what she was going to wear. Even her shoes and nylons. Okay? I remember sitting down writing a song that would become the proposal song for me to Sarah. I remember working my tail off for my dad and as a consultant for a developer, because as many of you guys know, I'm in construction. And I was the vice president of Roadworks, and at that time, I was called to be a consultant to help annex a subdivision. And God provided. He provided, and I was able to get the, the diamond ring that she wears every day for the last 27 years almost, okay? All intimate, all done for who? For everyone else? Nobody knew nothing. She's the only one that knew. But what were the rewards? What were the rewards? Four beautiful children, a wedding we'll never forget, a ring she still wears, right? A memory that we'll never, ever forget. And it was done between her and I. So when you sit down and you say, God, I want to be intimate with you this way. I know you own it all. And I know you're generous. So I want to be generous. And Jesus has warned me and said, you see things in private. The word there who, in verse four, look back in the NLT, who sees everything, the original Greek says, who sees everything in secret. Okay? Jesus wants us to know that there's intimate moments in your life as a Christian. And one of them is being able to be generous and doing these things that only God knows about. Like the violinist. All that work he did with his instructor that nobody else knew about until that day of. Listen to this verse from Malachi 3.10. No takers, write it down. You're going to need this. This is the Italian prophet, Malachi, if you don't know how to spell it. M-A-L-A-C-H-I. -A -L -L Malachi, M Malachi 3.10. This is what God says. Bring your tithes. Back then it was 10% of all they had. And there was a lot of different offerings and, you know, gifts that they would bring. Um, one calculated that if you would, to calculate all of them, it would be more like 43% of everything they had they would bring to God. Because there was a temple tax, there was offerings, there was all kinds of things that God wanted them to bring. But God took care of them. And he gave them more than they deserved. So this word tithe now is 10% of what they make. So watch this. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there'll be enough food in my temple. If you do so, says the Lord of the heaven's armies, armies, I will open the doors of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great that you won't even have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. You know, there's another word, verse in the Bible that says you should not put the Lord your God to the test. This is the only time God's saying, you got permission to put me to the test. Tithe, give, and see what I'll do. Godly giving equals godly rewards. That's my third point. Now, I'm sure that there's one person here that if I were to just say, hey guys, I'm sure you guys got your only God stories and you remember the first time that you heard from God's word that you should give to the church, right? And you weren't. I remember that happened to me. I wasn't giving. I don't know. I grew up in religious organization and, you know, my parents brought the envelope every week, you know? So, La Busta, we call it. Don't forget La Boost, you know? Anyways, my grandparents, are, oh man, anyway, sorry tell you a quick story about Promise Church. Sarah and I lived in a 4,700 square foot home. Way more than we needed. God pulled us out of there, put us in my parents' house. Then he put us in a 2,200 square foot home. We were giving and giving and giving, even when we had nothing. Pulled us out of there, put us in my dad's basement for 18 months. I didn't know what God was doing. I was mad. I was like, my four daughters sleeping in that one little corner? Me and my wife sleeping over here? What is going on? But God was setting us up. You know what he was setting us up for? The house we live in now. Small little house, does the job so that we can give of our time, our talent, and our finances so that every single one of you can be here on this day, right now, in this moment, sitting in those seats. And for that, give God an hallelujah with your hands. So 
So now the question comes, and here's the application. I'm going to end with this for the next few minutes here. How much do I give? I'm going to tell you, a lot of baby believers here. You guys just got baptized. We baptized 19 people over the last year here. Okay? You guys, it's time now. I told you, we're going to go from planting to people. It's always been about people because God loves people. But the vision and the way that we come off as leaders, we're going to move from the process and all these people we needed to do, all this pop-up church that we do, and it's a good thing. It's a great thing because people love doing this. So I'm not talking that down. One of my mentors had to warn me of that last week because I slipped and I made it look like it was a bad thing that we set up. It, it, it's not. It's a great thing. It's an awesome thing, okay? But I'm talking money now. The thing that pastors don't like to talk about. I hate talking about money because you lose a lot of friends. Seats are a lot more empty next week. But me as your pastor who loves you, who knows that God is the source of the food that comes to the sheep pen, and you guys are sitting in the sheep pen, and I'm going to say, no, God, I'm not going to feed them that. That might make them a little unsettled. I'd be a fool if I did that. So how much should you give? I'm going to tell you what God's word says. So that way it doesn't come from me and you won't get mad at me. Turn to your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. If everyone's got a Bible, I'm making it mandatory right now to turn there because you're going to need to know this. 2 Corinthians 9. You guys good? Chapter 9, is it? Chapter 9, sir. Starting verse 6. There we go. If you don't have a Bible, I would challenge you to close your eyes. You really need to hug this today. Embrace this. Remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. So how much do I give, Pastor Reno? Well, Pastor Paul tells us right here. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Verse 8, here's the comfort of those who give. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor and their good deeds will be remembered forever. So take a look at this in the verse. Get your eyes on the verse still. Don't look at me. Verse six, how much should I give? Consider the farmer. The more seed, the more crop. Verse 7, decide in your heart. How do I do this? Well, first of all, notice that it says, you decide, not somebody else. This is between you and the Lord. This is where the intimacy starts. This is where the faith starts building. This is where the endurance and perseverance starts coming, right? So you pray about this, and you ask God to put an amount on your heart. Some people ask me, but I can't. I prayed. I don't know. What do I do? That's what I'm going to tell you as your pastor. Somebody told me this. It worked. 5% of your income is how much should go in the Sunday basket. As a start, try to get it to 10%. Increase 1% at a time. Maybe 1% per year if that's all you can do. Okay? But... These are not the groundwork. Remember, Paul said, decide in your heart. If you're asking me, I'm telling you, start at 5%. Let's try to get to 10%. 1% per year after that. Some of you guys can start at 20% because God has blessed you that way. You got a bigger savings account than we do. And if you can, do it. And it's not just for Promise Church. It's the capital C Church. It's churches that preach the gospel and help people follow Jesus, learn the Bible, and build family. Because I know we get visitors here. So I'm telling you, 
You're being discipled from God's word to come off of the milk, as I was saying, to all those who just came to know the Lord and just got baptized, and now you're going to be eating filet mignon. You're getting off the spiritual milk and you're getting on spiritual meat. Spiritual meat is somebody who understands. I'm going to have to chew on this. I'm going to have to deal with this a little bit, but it's good. I tasted the charcoal. I tasted the Lowry seasoning salt, the garlic salt, right? The rub, whatever. The butter and the garlic on there, right? It's not like milk. Milk's boring unless you got Oreos, right? <laughs> so, so this is the meat that I'm trying to challenge you guys and disciple you. If you're not used to giving, you got to embrace this. Because this is God's word, and this is how the gospel goes forward. Okay? Look at verse 3. He says, don't do it under pressure. Do you see that? So, I just preached a sermon on giving. Am I one of those hypocrites now? I just told you to give. Am I pressuring you? This sermon is not to pressure you. This sermon is to tell you the truth of God's word. I told you what my points are. And you see right from Jesus' lips, you're going to be rewarded. And Jesus don't lie. And a lot of you guys right now, if you've been rewarded when you took an act of faith to start giving to the church, raise your hand. Look at that. Beautiful. More than half of you guys. So, don't give under pressure. Next, look at verse 3 there. I mean 7b. I'm going to my points. That are the 7b. Cheerfully giving. Give cheerfully. Right? Listen, giving is a stretch of faith, not a stretch of fear. Write that down. Giving is a stretch of faith, not a stretch of fear. F-E-A-R. Okay? God wants you to be at peace with this. Okay? And some of you, I know, you'll give that an excuse to never be at peace with it. Don't do that. Okay? God loves a cheerful giver. And that's why he says that there in that verse. Verse 8, he says, God will provide all you need. So if you're deciding about giving and God said, test me, you bring it in, I'll give you more than you can handle. Put it to the test, God says, in Malachi 3.10, Malachi 3.10. And then look what it says in 8b. You'll have plenty to share with others because God's the source, the audience of one, the source. And then look at in 9, it says God remembers and God rewards. Where do you get that from? I'll tell you where I get it from. You see this in verse 9 there. They share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forevermore. This lines up with what Jesus is saying. He says, your father who sees everything, go back to Matthew chapter 6 now, will reward you. He'll reward you. So, I hope and pray that these teachings that are hard to teach in a me, me, me culture, I want my latte with skinny no foam, half pump, half shot, decaf, that kind of culture, right? We're not programmed to give. We're programmed to get. Because that's what our toxic tension culture teaches us. But the body of Christ says, no, we're going to give because he gave it all for us. He gave it all for us. So I hope and pray that these teachings from the scripture will challenge you and bring wonderful blessings on your life. Not as a means of prosperity. Because there's crazy guys out there that say, if you dial this one eight 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 number and give to this number and then you give to us, God's going to get you that new Cadillac. I could just feel it, you know, or that new Mercedes. No, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about godly giving. And godly giving must be done right. Righteousness must be done right. Godly giving is for the audience of one. The third point is godly giving equals godly rewards. And then remember our fourth point, godly giving is intimate. If you didn't write it down yet, godly giving is intimate. You guys good? You don't hate me after this? All right, good. All right. The last benediction at the Haynes. Stand up, please. Before this benediction, please take those postcards with you. If you know someone that goes to Promise Church that you might run into, please give it to them. They're going to need to know. People are going to come here next Sunday. We're making a huge sign that say we moved. I'm hoping that the printer gets them done on time. He's backed up. But they should be out there. Um, so help us get the word out. Women, 
The Bible study starting Monday again. I just want you guys to know, the women's Bible study is a thriving ministry here. Started with like six, seven women. It's multi-generational from as young as 14 to as old as 80-something. I don't know how old she is, but she's beautiful and looks 50. And, but I know she's 80. So, and I'm not going to tell you who she is. So women, where is the women's Bible study on Monday? In two weeks. Where? Baker Community Center downstairs. And there's only a woman's bathroom down there. Isn't that cool? Okay. You're going to sign up for the partnership course. I'll meet you back there. If you are thinking, even thinking, about going to the marriage retreat and you don't have the funds, we have just been given over $850 in scholarships. That is insane. And there's more coming. So listen, if you're even thinking about it and money is a problem, it's going to hold you back from going because you've got to budget otherwise, come and talk to me. I'll make sure you guys don't get left behind. Okay? All right. Who's ready for the last benediction at Haynes? Come on, make some noise. I told you I wasn't yelling at you. I got to talk louder. The cameras aren't going to pick it up. So, But now I'm going to yell at you. Our benediction <clears throat> comes from Hebrews 13, verse 20 through 21. Now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you for all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you, through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him, all glory to him, both now and forever, and all God's people said... Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. I'll see you next Sunday at the Bartlett Nature Center.